Hey guys, James here with another uh, video. Today I thought I would talk to you about uh, maintenance and really kind of uh, give you a snapshot inside uh, my workbench and the tips, and tools, and products that I use um, and that I recommend in order to accomplish my job. And uh, this really comes out of kind of an everyday type question and answer thing that I get from customers about um, sharing some of that information and really looking to, to gain a better appreciation for how to maintain their own guns. So hopefully you'll learn something new here today, maybe uh, see something you haven't seen before, um, or just reinforce maybe some of those thoughts and um, concepts that you've already had. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> and I think I'll start out by saying, um, you know, where should we start? And really, where you should start is by reading that owner's manual that came with your gun. Imagine that, a novel idea like that. Most people don't even look at it. Um, they might not, not even pull back the foam separation inside their HK handgun case to see that and the sticker that came with it. Um, but you really do need to take a look. There's basic uh, information in there that applies to all firearms, but there can be some specific information to your exact model um, that you need to adhere to. Um, maybe not so much as the newer guns, uh, but some of the older ones, you got to really pay attention to what they don't, what they recommend you not do with them. Um, one of the things that sticks out in mind, it comes to ammunition. You know, there's a hell of a lot of development that's happened in the last decade with uh, ammunition, especially you know, plus P plus high pressure, you know, ammunition that we didn't have back when a lot of those legacy HKs um, were designed in the 50s, 60s, 70s. They just, they just weren't there. Um, so if you're um, not aware of that and you've just got to shoot your 158 grain plus P plus 9 mil ammo and you then um, don't adhere to those recommendations and put that in your HK P9S, well, you're going to have a, a pretty bad day. Um, so just taking the time to look through the manual will really help you out from there. Um, and then what we'll do now is kind of take a deeper dive into take a look here on the workbench and I'll share with you uh, kind of the tricks of the trade of, of what I use. Well, the first thing I think about when I want to clean, maintain my weapons is having a nice, quiet, gentle place to do that. As you can see, I've created that here for myself. It's a nice, happy place I can go to and, and really uh, focus on the task at hand and enjoy the workspace I've been. And I'm sure, like most of you guys, I started out the same way, uh, doing all my cleaning on the kitchen table, getting yelled at for it. Um, but it's nice if you can find a place that you can set aside that is that. And that, that way you have everything you need. You're not having to go upstairs, downstairs, in the garage, the basement, looking for something that you specifically need for the task at hand. It's right there and, it, and it's going to be uh, it's gonna be ready when you need it. So as you can see behind me, um, I've got a Stanley Vidmar workstation. I've got it to the left and the right as well. Um, and I love them. I love them. Um, they're expensive, uh, but you you get what you pay for. And uh, you know, like most people, you know, you start out with uh, what you can afford, and you might have that Sears workbench or something from Home Depot. Um, but as as you get a little more experience, you realize, hey, I need something a little nicer than this. Or maybe that was great if you were a mechanic and you're working in a garage, but for what I do, it may be a little different. Um, so. One of the cool benefits about this, other than how well built they are, um, is I got plenty of space um, to do what I need to uh, to get done. I don't ever have to feel like I, I can't stretch my arms out or have multiple projects all at one hand. And I've got massive amounts of, of organized storage. So each one of these drawers rolls out nice um, and they're very deep. I'll give you some extra close-up shots of this, but like for example here, you know, I, I've got all my parts organized by gun um, type. Um, with all the individual parts as the drawers go down, so they're all within arm's reach. And if, if something breaks and needs to be replaced, it's right there. I don't have to go hunt for it. I don't have to get online and order it, wait for it to get here five days later. Uh, you know, it's right there. Um, the, uh, the tools that I use most often, I'll leave right there on the workbench. Um, and the ones that are a little deeper, I've got in drawers here on the left side of the workbench. And then I keep a stall willy toolbox right here on the top. So, uh, Hammer, it's right there. Um, you know, punches, uh, picks, screwdrivers, whatever it is, it's all right there up, up close and, and, and 
obviously stall woolly stuff, German tooling, very expensive, um, but you know, for me it's worth the uh, extra expenditure because it, it just works and I never have to worry about the stuff breaking like some of the cheaper stuff does, which would then have, cause you to have to stop what you're doing, get in the car and drive back to Home Depot to buy another tool. Um, I just don't have that problem with this stuff. Um, so very, very helpful to have those things. And now I'll give you a close up of some of the other products and, um, that I use on a day-to-day -day basis that um, are really helpful and could help you as well. Okay, so let's take a look at the workbench, how I have it set up and organized to do the job I need to do every day. Um, the first thing you need is good lighting. Obviously, I've got overhead lighting, um, but if you can get yourself um, you know, good adjustable light, it'll really help you see in those hard um, to reach areas that can be kind of frustrating. This one here is from Pro's Kit. And what I like about this one is beyond just regular lighting, is it actually has a magnifier glass there too, so I can actually zoom in on the things that uh, <clears throat> become a little more difficult to work on. Can't say enough about um, the uh, mats here from Ransom. This is a Ransom Mega Mat, really great product. Um, <clears throat> keeps obviously the workbench cleaner, um, and it cleans up itself pretty easily after projects. Um, but it's got this nice raised rib um, construction prevents the uh, small parts from rolling off the mat, and then these little divided sections where I can place tools, keep them out of the way, or a specific set of, of parts to keep them from getting mixed up with other things. So I like that a lot. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's neat to have, um, these ones here from Tech Mat. If you're not as familiar with the firearm that you may be doing extended uh, disassembly on, it's kind of nice to be able to have this as the mat you're working off of because you can see you know, all of the individual parts and where they fit in. Um, as you're working versus having to go back and pull out your owner's manual and go online to figure out something specific. Uh, so that's kind of cool. And then I have to give a, a shout out to my man, uh, Mark at Present Arms. He makes these excellent products um, that are very, very helpful when you're doing work on your weapons, especially the disassembly and reassembly projects where it otherwise would require two, uh, you know, a third or a fourth hand. For this example here is SP1 um, kit. It's got a mag post, so you can you know, set your um, receiver frame right there on there on the uh, the top. It's got a little section here and keep your parts. I like to work this when I'm doing um, LEM conversions on you know USPs because I can work straight on the top of the weapon and I keep all the parts organized on the bottom without them getting mixed up. He's got a similar one here. Um, for the Beretta 90 series with a mag post. And then when you remove the mag post itself, and uh, you can then use it to work with uh, the slide. So it's got little cutout areas where the slide can fit in in different angles uh, for the proper removal and disassembly of those parts as well. Um, and this one's really cool, <clears throat> more of a recent one. Um, I've had this one here for a couple of years as a prototype, but he just released them a uh, short while ago for the VP series. Um, so if I'm working on these guns, again, I've got an adjustable mag post on the top, uh, but then in those areas where you're having to remove those tiny little pins and you don't want um, you know, the receiver sliding around on you where you could end up slipping and damaging uh, you know, the soft polymer, it actually has cutouts where it actually fits in place and holds it stable. It's one here for the trigger as well. Um, you know, these kind of things uh, really... Um, you don't realize how much you're going to need them and use them until, uh, until you actually get one. And I'm using those things all the time now, so they're very helpful. Uh, they've got a larger one here I'll to show some pictures of as well uh, for the ARs. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty, uh, pretty helpful as well um, if you're into uh, doing full disassembly, reassembly of an MR556 and HK416 come in handy. I keep most of the tools that I'm going to use on a day-to-day -day basis right here on the bench. Um, but I've also got a stall willy toolbox um, where, again, I can kind of organize them a little bit better. Um, kind of out of the way, but still close at hand. And, again, you know, the German tools, they're expensive, but, uh, but they're worth it. Um, and then, you know, again, mentioned this before, but here's a, you know, a view of kind of the parts, uh, you know, storage drawers that I have you know, here on the right side. Everything I need by gun at hand. I don't even have to get up out of the seat to grab them. Okay, so let's talk about cleaning lubricants, protectants. You know, what products do I 
use the most and recommend versus what I don't recommend. Um, I think, like most people growing up, um, I think that my exposure initially was to the Hoppies brand. Uh, that's what uh, you know, my dad had in his uh, cleaning kit that I used. Um, and there's nothing really wrong with it for its intended use. The, the downside for me is the smell. Uh, so for it, anything else that's got a strong scent to it, uh, that just kind of turns me off to it, especially when you think about working on this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. I just don't want that. So that kind of takes those out of the mix. Um, the one I've had the most success with in those categories, cleaner lubricant and protector, is a uh, product from a company called Slip 2000. And this is their Extreme Weapons Lube. Um, they also make an Extreme Weapons Grease for some of those areas where you want a little bit more um, contact and it comes in this little jar um, or that comes in a syringe if you really want to get precise application. Um, so that, those are the ones I use daily and uh, I found that as a cleaner they do an excellent job of breaking up the carbon whether it's just in a light area or if it's really hardened on somewhere like a gas piston. Um, a protectant, or I'm sorry, lubricant, um, again never had an issue with any of the guns not running smoothly and reliably um, and as a protectant it, it does awesome at giving that extra barrier over the weapon um, it actually you know, bonds to the uh, to the metal uh, so as, as I'm cleaning uh, I'll actually wipe it down I'll wipe the gun off the first time if I let it sit for a little while I come back it'll I'll still get more carbon off um, you know minutes later because um, it's actually bringing it out of, of the metal um, and then on the protected side again it's bonding in there and really giving that good protection so I've been happy with them the products I would I've not had great success with and I, I would not recommend as far as a lubricant and protectant I think they do a great job as a cleaner but it, the all three kind of trifecta um, is frog lube and uh, fire clean and what I've seen with that is that if, if, if it's applied as any more than a light coat uh, it'll actually coagulate and become really gummy over time uh, so you clean a gun, you put it back in the gun safe, you don't take it out for a while, um, and then you do. I get a lot of customers who send me a weapon, they're like, hey, my, my gun's all, all jammed up, I just, it, the hammer won't fall, the fire control systems aren't working, or the firing pin's um, stuck, and I don't know what's wrong. And I disassemble it, and that's what I find is this really coagulated, gummed up uh, material from, from those products. Um, so haven't been really impressed with it as a, as a uh, lubricant and protectant, but cleaner does great specifically like uh, fire clean uh, wonderful product if you're using on those high volume areas like you shoot machine guns a lot you want to lubricate your gas piston or uh, you can take apart your suppressor and clean the baffles does a great job at that um, but I'd stick with something like the uh, slip 2000 products for uh, for those other jobs now you're back you've uh, you shot your pistol uh, for example and you're back on the workbench to do a cleaning and again, the recommendation is always, every time you fire your weapon, you need to do a cleaning. Now, how thorough a cleaning you do uh, is totally going to be uh, dependent on really your skill level, uh, your level of OCD, uh, like I have, um, and time. Uh, but you definitely want to make sure you do a limited cleaning every time you, you, uh, you shoot it. So, one of the common issues I see that just kind of creates more of a mess for shooters is they immediately break down their, their weapon and start spraying solvent in there um, and then go right into cleaning. And the challenge with that is you just um, basically create a big muddy mess when you do that. So what I would recommend you do is just take a little tactical pause and before you spray solvent in, just grab a paper towel and use that in all those areas where there's a lot of carbon buildup um, within the weapon. And you will be surprised at how much easier it is afterwards um, to then apply your solvent and get started. And it won't just, it won't be as nearly as big a mess. Okay, once you do um, apply that solvent, you're gonna need some kind of, you know, toothbrush, all-purpose brush, that you're really just trying to agitate those areas where most of the carbon and gunk buildup is, and that'll make the removal of those areas um, much easier. Um, I'm a big fan of having a dental pick as well. It helps really get into some of those tighter areas and, and really those areas where that carbon buildup can be really, uh, really severe. Again, you're just agitating uh, in that process. And then I am a massive proponent of having 
um, patches. I go through patches like crazy. I use these large uh, square patches. You can get them in bulk from Brownells. Um, but I'll put solvent on those and, uh, and then use those to clean around you know, all of the different areas um, of, the, of the weapon. Big fan of Q-tips as well. Um, I should own stock in Q-tips for as much as I do. Um, but that, again, can get in those areas, scrub those out. Now, depending on uh, how much you shoot or how dirty the environment is you shoot, may, may mean you need to do a more thorough cleaning than you're disassembling the gun further. Not as big a concern for those guys who own, own weapons and they, you know, go and shoot 200 or 500 rounds. Um, but where I see that, you know, as, as a business standpoint, is more the guys who have owned these guns for decades and they've just kind of had that deferred maintenance of a more um, detailed cleaning. Um, so sometimes you'll see things where it says, you know, every 5,000 rounds or every 10,000 rounds, you should have a complete detailed cleaning, meaning disassemble the gun completely. Um, but it's not really as much a round count as uh, exposure to those type of elements. So if you if you live out in the desert and you're training a lot out there and you get a lot of dirt in your gun, as well as carbon buildup, then that, you know, that's a factor you've got to deal with with cleaning. If you live in a more humid environment, maritime environment, you've got more humidity to deal with, well, then you've got to factor that into your considerations as well. Um, so for me, I see a lot of the uh, more legacy pistols, um, when we're talking about handguns, you know, P9S, uh, P7 series, they're all steel construction. Uh, so uh, you know, surface rust can be an issue. And even if you think you get it, did a good job of cleaning in these components, uh, you're not able to reach in between these parts and you can get uh, surface rust and gunk buildup in between those components um, or in the you know, metal frame or, uh, of the, the slide or the receiver as well. So it, it really takes disassembling the weapon completely in order to reach into all those places that you know, a Q-tip can't and compressed air won't blow out. Um, so you have to keep all those things in mind as you're working along um, to keep your gun up and running. Um, inside your uh, slide, the main areas that you're going to really want to focus on is right there at the, uh, the lip of the extractor. Uh, you'll get a lot of carbon buildup underneath there and that can affect your, your uh, extractor um, capability on your pistol. So when you're working on everything else, again, a nice dental pick, you can scrape, scrape in there and work on that. Obviously, you want to test your firing pin and make sure that the, uh, your firing pin block and your firing pin itself are moving freely. Uh, you know, when you clean the weapons, uh, you're going to make sure that you use, uh, you know, some kind of bore brush um, as you're working inside your barrel um, with some kind of um, rod. So I've got this old one I've had for years. I can screw on the brush at the end of it and run it um, from the breech through to the front. So you don't want to go the other direction because now you're going against the direction of the way the, the barrel is designed for the bullets to flow and you can create damage. So I would start from the rear, I'd move forward and clean that out. And then I don't want to pull it back through. So every time I um, do that, I've got to remove the tool and then come back through. And then if I want to then switch to, um, you know, using your patches, you just fold your patches over, run them through, put solvent on them, run them through the barrel. Again, I would take it out as I remove it back out through the back. Um, so that's a key area as far as that. I'll also, a lot of the browning style um, actions, you'll get carbon build up here in the sides where the locking areas are. You get carbon build up all around the feed ramp. So make sure you clean those things off as well. Uh, the internal components, um, again, carbon build up all around where the barrel and the, and the uh, chamber are going to be. A lot of gunk build up there. And then back in here in the fire control components, you'll see a lot. Of, uh, of action there. So if you can get in there and clean them out, um, brush them out with your brush, get, get a light coat of solvent on there, um, you should be nice and smooth. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you and covers really some of the uh, specific uh, factors that you want to um, focus on when you're doing just a, a limited cleaning. Okay, so now let's talk about magazines. This is another area that I think is really overlooked by most owners. Uh, they just don't really focus on cleaning their magazines. Uh, and it's obviously the weakest link to any of the firearms, usually related to uh, the cleanliness of the inside of the magazine 
and the condition of the mag spring itself and sometimes the feed lips. Uh, with H&K, luckily they do a, a really, really good job with magazine design and um, with their metal magazines, um, you don't normally have a problem with the feed lips unless you've done a whole lot of training where you've been dropping the magazines on hard ground concrete. Um, then you can have issues where the magazine feed lips will chip and, uh, and break. But what I see a lot of times are guys who it doesn't look like they've ever taken their magazine apart and cleaned it. So um, with the metal ones, obviously you've got to make sure you're cleaning all of it because it's all metal. Um, so I would get some solvent, I'd wipe down the outside of the magazines, make sure I, I lubricate and wipe down the magazine springs themselves. You can see this is an earlier P7 K3 and it's more of a silver uncoated finish whereas some of the newer magazine springs, uh, they'll, they'll have a black, like maritime type um, finish around them um, to give them a little more protection against the elements. Um, but the earlier ones, you wanna make sure you wipe down. You'll have to wipe down your, your uh, magazine base plate and get in the, in the grooves. And then where you really notice it, what I'll do is I'll put solvent on the, the, uh, the patch and then I'll run it inside with my brush and get all inside the uh, the inside of the magazine body and then sometimes you might have to go in with uh, with your dental pick and scrape around those areas um, of the feed lips and then come in again with some solvent on your q-tips and get those areas as well okay uh, to clean these things out and you'll be surprised at the amount of gunk that'll come out of those things when you do that now what do i do afterwards well again this is really kind of dependent on the environment you're in if you're in a, in, a, in a humid environment, a maritime type environment uh, where you're worried about rust, then you might want to leave that light coat of solvent on and inside the, the components. You never want to have it wet because too much solvent buildup can gum it up or can deaden the primers of the, the rounds in there, but you might want to have a little wet. Now, if I was going to be in a more drier environment, a sandy environment, after I'm done with all the solvent, I might go get a clean patch and then run that clean patch back through the inside of the magazine body. Uh, so now it's clean, but it's also dry and I don't have to worry about any dust, dirt accumulating and, and attaching to that solvent. Um, so that's a consideration to think about magazines, don't overlook them. And while we're talking about magazines, um, another thing I see quite often um, is when um, you know, people have magazines, they just look at them as, as the same as the weapon. So, you know, I bought my Bought my gun and it came with two mags and these mags are going to last the life of the gun and that may not be the case. Um, you need to look at more of these as a consumable type item. Okay, again, the feed lip areas you want to make sure that you're paying attention to. Um, that there's no cracking, chipping, especially on the polymer ones. You know, the newer design magazines, a lot of them you'll see uh, there's a metal insert that's inside the polymer, and that prevents these things from, from spreading as much or chipping as much. Um, whereas some other gun companies, they don't put those kind of inserts in there. And you can actually see a fully loaded, loaded magazine, the feed lips will start to expand, um, and then that can lead to nosing up and the rounds popping out um, when you're uh, trying to insert a mag and, and keep shooting. So um, pay attention to your magazine body, um, but you really need to pay attention to your magazine spring. And people just don't think about this. Um, the repetitive compression and, and release of your magazine spring or the fact that you've left it compressed because you've got fully loaded magazines for however many years, you know, that puts wear on this. And I've, I've heard the debate of, well, it's not the fact that it, it you know, it was fully loaded, it was compressed. It's the, it's the repetitive back and forth. And what I would say is, okay, you squat down and hold that squat for one minute and you do squats for one minute. And at the end of that one minute, both of their legs are going to be tired. Um, so, um, the, the bottom line is these things wear out. The test you can do is obviously if you have a firearm, make sure you've got extra mag springs. Um, you always wanna have those on hand. But if I take the magazine spring out of the gun and then I take a brand, brand new magazine spring, and this is, this is the one that came out of the gun, this is the new one, and I lay them right next to each other and I notice a significant difference in height, well, guess what? Then this magazine's pretty worn out or magazine spring's worn out and I need to replace it. Um, so that's just a simple test. And don't be the guy who then tries to stretch your magazine spring back out to get it back the right length. It's never going to go there. You're going to have a, <clears throat> a weakened magazine spring. And where you're going to see that when you're actually shooting is that last round or that second to last round um, will nose up and you'll have a, a malfunction with, uh, 
with the cycling of the weapon. And basically what that means is as the magazine spring is compressed, it has all that strength, but as it gets to the end of its compression and it's worn out, there's not enough spring tension to have the, the spring keep up with how fast the slide is cycling. So that slide will start coming back and it'll just grab the front of the round to the back of the round and you'll get it to nose up in, in the magazine or in the, uh, in the weapon. So it doesn't mean you need to throw the whole magazine out per se, um, but magazine springs, they're pretty cheap. Keep those on hand, rotate them in. Uh, I've got a buddy of mine who religiously rotates his every two years regardless, doesn't even look at them, just throws them in the, in the trash and puts new ones in. Uh, some other people might want to be a little more frugal, uh, but pay attention to that. And then I always recommend <clears throat> that you have training mags and carry mags um, if you can afford to do so. Um, so I've got, when I go out and I teach courses or I'm training on my own, there's a completely separate set of magazines I use for that. So if I drop them on the ground, they get rolled around, whenever I step on them, uh, no big deal. And if there's a malfunction related to it because there's some damage to the magazine or the spring, again, then that just gives me an extra rep of working through a malfunction clearance on the range. But the magazines that I actually carry my weapons, those things are brand new and those are not ones that I'm taking out and dropping and, and, uh, and causing damage to. Um, so if you can afford to, that's always helpful. And then, you know, when you're training and you have a problem with your magazine, make sure you mark that magazine. I get a lot of customers who contact me and say, hey, I've got a problem with my gun. I was out shooting and it did this. And I'll say, okay, well, did you try to see if it had that same malfunction with other magazines? And they'll say, no, I just used that one magazine. Or they'll say, I don't remember. Well, if you can mark that one magazine and then you realize through testing that you didn't have that same problem with the other magazines, well, then you can narrow that problem down to that, that one magazine. And then you can either you know replace it completely or replace the magazine body or the spring or whatnot. But hope that helps. Before we put our weapon away, after we've done whatever maintenance and cleaning on the gun, we always want to make sure we do a function check. Don't just throw it back in your holster or the gun safe uh, because you're missing a crucial step that could come back to bite you in the ass when you go to pull your weapon and use it the next time and it goes click instead of bang. Okay, so it's very easy to improperly reassemble a, a pistol, uh, rifle, and, uh, and you want to catch it now. So the first thing we're going to do um, to test this for function check is you're going to make sure if you've got external safety, go ahead and put it on safe and attempt to pull the trigger. And the weapon should not allow you to actuate the trigger or the hammer and fire control system. Okay. Next, you'll put it on uh, fire and you'll attempt to do a full double action trigger pull. And you should see the trigger should actuate, the hammer should actuate. And you're going to hold the trigger back to the rear and now you're going to uh, rack the slide back to the rear and release it. And this simulates the actual firing, ejecting, recoil, and, and, uh, and rechambering over the next round. And then you're going to release the trigger to reset and pull the trigger again. And now that's testing to let you see that the weapon is actually resetting the trigger like it's supposed to. Okay. At that point, you can release it. If you wanted to then try a single action shot as well, again, pull the trigger, hold it back to the rear, cycle the, the slide, simulate recoil, release it to its reset point, fire again. And then lastly, we're going to insert an empty magazine and we're going to rack the slide back to the rear and check to make sure that the magazine follower uh, works in concert with the slide lock, uh, slide stop in order to hold the slide back to the rear and then that you can manually release the slide uh, forward again. Okay, so let me cover the last topic here and that's the subject of a solvent tank or an ultrasonic cleaner. Um, and what I will say is that for your basic maintenance of handguns and rifles is resist the temptation to have that be the easy button. Um, don't put your handguns and your rifles assembled into solvent tanks, okay? Um, now, is there a place for it? Is there an application? Sure. You know, when I was in the Marine Corps and we would do a lot of heavy machine gun shooting and you had, you know, specific parts of those weapons that were really, really um, dirty and had a lot of carbon buildup and caked on areas, um, that was helpful. If you can put a piston or a bolt inside one of those things, break that up. Um, but we weren't putting the entire weapon in there. And what you see instead um, are owners who are trying to take you know, their entire assembled handgun and just drop it in the uh, ultrasonic cleaner um, and thinking that's going to be the solution. Um, so think about that whole process and what that solvent, what that ultrasonic cleaner is doing 
is it's breaking down um, that carbon, that gunk buildup to remove it. Well, most guns these days, you know, they're made out of polymer or plastic construction, um, and that solvent's attacking <laughs> that rather um, delicate, especially in key areas, polymer. So, you know, in some of the main areas of the weapon, no problem. Um, but in some of those areas where it's a little weaker, a little thinner, now you're, you're compromising the rigidity of that. And if you're one of these guys who, you know, just cannot stay away from, a, from stippling your Glock, well, again, you're weakening those areas around the grip frame as you're um, removing uh, material and heating it up and, and whatnot. Um, you're just weakening your, your uh, polymer plastic components by putting them in those systems. Um, if you've got those areas that have you know, paint on them for the safety um, button, it can remove the paint. If you have um, your handgun slide, and you're putting in there, well, the adhesive that holds your front sight um, in, it can make that fall out. Um, if you have um, tritium, it can kill the tritium. If you have a fiber optic sight, it can weaken the actual fiber optic post where it can snap and break off. Um, so all of those things uh, of a, a matter of weakening the intended material, it's just not a good idea. Um, the next reason, is, is because what do you see when you pull those weapons out is the solvent ultrasonic cleaner, it will dry out the weapon. So yeah, it, may, it might have got it clean and got all the carbon gunk buildup out, but now your weapon is completely dry. And so what do people do then? Um, sometimes they just put it right back into a holster and, and go um, about their business, and now you've got a gun that's bone dry, which would be like driving a car with no oil in the engine. It just doesn't make any sense, and it's just gonna lead to uh, the stoppages and malfunctions, um, or they take their weapon and they just spray, 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 spray with solvent, thinking that's going to solve the problem. And you either end up with having too much solvent in certain areas where now it's dripping out of the gun and it's making a mess, or it's you know just um, just an attraction magnet for dirt and and lint and whatnot. Or in most cases, you're just never going to get the solvent into the right places because the, the tolerance in between certain key parts is so tight um, that spraying lube in there is just going to roll off the sides and not get in between in the right areas. So again, now you're not getting the lubrication where you need it. Um, so um, and again, the environment you're working into, if it's dried out, um, you'll end up having rust and corrosion. And that's the point where even H&K was seeing examples of this with customers who um, were using solvent tanks and they complained that their guns were, were all having corrosion and rust issues. They did the investigation, that's what they found out. So instead of issuing another warning label inside your owner's manual that people don't read, they just decided they would put more of a maritime thick coating finish on all the internal components to help uh, prevent that. But it just doesn't make any sense. So um, I'm sure I'll get comments from guys who you know, want to say otherwise. Um, but that's the experience I've seen with it, and I get more than enough guns that come across my workbench that when I take them apart, uh, they, they look crusty. Um, and they look crusty because people have used solvent tanks and, and, uh, and not um, applied the lubrication back to those parts afterwards. And brittle components that break. You start talking about these legacy guns like a P9S or a, a P7, um, you break the, the grips and the trigger guards on some of those guns and you may have a very hard time uh, finding replacement parts for those now just because, again, you were too lazy to, to do a, a cleaning like you should. So leave the solvent tanks to, uh, to those heavier um, built-up components, not an entire weapon itself. Okay, okay guys, that's it for uh, this short video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, got to see kind of inside how I stay organized and the, the tools and tips that I use in order to accomplish... Uh, the job I do here um, for the HK fan base. Um, so, um, as always, I'm incredibly humbled to be able to provide this kind of support. Uh, so, if you've got HK weapons and you need help with, uh, or you're looking for unique um, firearms training, uh, give me a shout. Always happy to help. Take care, guys. I'll see you next time.